My name is Ron Olski. I practice family law, collaborative family law currently in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. I'm originally from southwestern Minnesota, a small town of 260 people. Came up to the Twin Cities and went to the University of St. Thomas, then to the University of Minnesota Law School. Graduated from there way back when and started practicing family law back in 1983 and have done really family law from 1983 to 2008. And course of all that and married and have three wonderful children who are around here and uh, done other things but within my practice what has happened is I've started doing family law because that was what was most interesting to me and doing it mostly in the traditional way for a lot of years probably 20 years and like a lot of people that practice family law the, the more I practiced it the more I enjoyed it the more I became thirsty for ways to do it better and differently um, probably unlike Stu and some others, I wouldn't say that I reached a point where I was just so tired of it I couldn't do it anymore. I mean, I may have gotten to that point later, um, but I just had a strong sense that it, it could be done better and differently. And there was definitely a different feeling on some cases where you felt like you really helped people and other cases where um, the damage done was so great that you just felt, I just felt like a bull in a china shop. Even if I went into court and got them what they were asking for, and even in those cases where we literally got everything we asked for, the damage was so great that it was really hard to, um, to, to feel good about that unless we could find a better way to do it. And, you know, one story I sometimes recount for, for parent groups and stuff is a case where I did a custody trial for a mother who was fighting, uh, disputing custody of a 12-year-old daughter, had grown sons who were testifying against her, and the court service report was against her. And a month before trial, she fired her other her lawyer and asked me to help her. And I, went into trial and helped her, and we had the, one of the most painful trials I've ever been involved, where we had sons testifying against the mother, and back and forth, very, very painful. And we, quote unquote, won the case. We got custody of the 12-year-old, and, and my, the, my client was happy, I was happy, I got paid. We were patting ourselves on the back and floating high for, for weeks and months until I could see what really happened. And over the course of years, I mean, this poor 12-year-old daughter had he ran away from home, had drug problems, was in juvenile court, I mean, nothing, Nothing really good happened in her life afterwards, and so the, you know, at least during the time that I followed her for seven or eight years, and I thought, boy, what did we win there? I mean, what was achieved? I'm not saying we created this or caused a problem, but there was no way for me to feel that that was in any sense a victory or something that um, you know my client was really looking for. When, when she first came into my office, she said what she cared about most was her daughter and her daughter's well-being, and the time I'd spent in that case hadn't done anything to really enhance that. Um, and so not to say trials never should happen, there isn't a time and a place to do that, but it was clear to me that that really wasn't what I was drawn to family law to do, that that kind of help wasn't really what was, was going to feel satisfying. So anyhow, as like a lot of people, when mediation came along, I got very interested in that, got trained as a mediator, encouraged mediation, still do mediate, still encourage mediation, and um, you know, still believe in the future of mediation. Uh, it never became my career to be a full-time mediator for a whole variety of reasons. Probably wasn't what my main skill set was. And there was a sense after a bit that while mediation was certainly helping, it wasn't taking things as far as we wanted to go. And it didn't didn't define the role of the attorney. And, you know, because I, I think like Stu and others, I like the part of being aligned with the client, sitting down and, and saying, okay, I will work with you, whether you call an advocate or a friend or somebody who's there to look at their point of view. I like that role, and, and while I, you know, I probably could be happy as a mediator as well, there was a part of me that wanted to be in that role, and um, the sense of having that role done differently was something that I, I think I was attracted to, like a lot of people, right up to the time that I heard of Stu Webb's idea. Now, when I, and I knew Stu before uh, he started Collaborative, had a couple of cases with him before 1990, and um, I wish I could tell some sort of scorched earth story about how he was this mean, awful person, but uh, the truth is Stu was Stu even then. I mean, he was a good guy, and a, the kind of guy you wanted to settle a case with even in a traditional process, but knew of him, and so when he came along with the idea of collaborative, I was listening and interested because I wanted a different way, and also because Stu had you know integrity and seemed like somebody who would have some great ideas. Um, and went to, a, I've got a handout somewhere, but what I think is probably the first training Stu did was a one-hour 
brown bag thing downtown in 1991 or two, where for one hour he taught us. That was our first training at collaborative practice. Intrigued by it, interested in it, loved to, the idea of it. But looking back now, I, I see, frankly, you know, like a lot of folks, I didn't really quite understand it for many years later. I mean, what I thought Stu was about and collaborative was about was what a lot of people probably still think. It just sort of let's all be nicer to each other and let's start a movement in which we all agree to be nicer to each other. And that's a good thing, nothing wrong with that, a lot of movement doing that, but it, you know, it took a long time for me to realize there's a lot of, there's more involved here than just that. So I, a lot of people, I sort of dabbled in it and did cases and said I was doing collaborative when I wasn't just because you know, I was being nice to people. Didn't quite understand why we needed this withdrawal provision piece. I mean, like a lot of folks thought, well, this is nice, but the withdrawal thing is just sort of excess baggage. Um, so it wasn't really, so from probably until about 1993, seven or eight that it really kind of started to notice that there was more going on with this. And I think what caused it, we had some people come into town and train from California about the team process, Pauline uh, Tesler and, and uh, um, Nancy Ross and, and uh, a number of people, had got Peggy Thompson come in and trained and, and, and the team process got excited, but I also started to realize that there was a lot going on, that collaborative had started to grow in other communities, in California and Vancouver, and and it really caused me to take a second look. I thought, well, maybe there's something more to this than what I'm thinking there is. And went to the first conference in Chicago. There was a group of people that got together then uh, about six months after that training, about 1990, 2000, and um, went to that where they discussed collaborative in various states and in, in provinces in, North, in the United States and North America. And I was really starting to get struck with the idea that there was something bigger going on. So. That was sort of my really real understanding of collaborative, really, which just goes back to about 1999. So at that point, I started to really get training and getting, getting more involved, started to take on real cases and started to really understand how different practice could be when you operated outside the shadow of the courthouse and operated with people who were trained and committed to this. And so I really started to get pretty excited about the idea of doing collaborative once I got the idea of what it really was. And at that point, got it more involved in the local organization here in Minnesota, which at that time was probably 30 or 40 people. Uh, went on the board of that, worked with a good group of people to try to help this grow. And then in, uh, in Minnesota, kind of in 2002, 2003, four is where things really started to pick up collaboratively here as well. And uh, I think it was you know, about two, May of 2005, was when, no, 2004, May of 2004 was when I decided to start doing exclusively collaborative work because I was getting more and more cases, doing more of it, starting to do uh, leadership stuff on a, on a statewide basis. And, uh, but like a lot of folks, you know, afraid to take a leap, I was probably doing maybe 30% collaborative and getting more and more tired of the other stuff. But I needed to make a living. I didn't have the luxury of being able to make less money than I was really making and uh, was pretty afraid to limit my practice, but was to, starting to get tempted with the idea, well, what if I did this exclusively, what would that look like? Somebody had said, well, why don't you just try doing that for a month? Just just take just collaborative cases for a month. I said, I'll try that for a month. The world's not going to come apart if I do it for a month, but I did. And got a few interesting cases and went well. And so I decided to do it for another month, and uh, did it for another month, and got a few more interesting cases, and, and uh, was starting to get into this more and more. And of course, as you can predict, started to do it month by month, and started to realize, I mean, not only was it um, you know, so attractive to do it, it became hard to go back, but that I started to attract more collaborative cases. I think uh, people would come to me not having heard of collaborative, but when they heard I was limiting my practice to collaborative, in some ways that drew their attention even more. Well, here's a guy who's really only gonna take a certain kind of case. And so um, I think there was, you know, I hadn't done it as a marketing thing, quote unquote, but in some ways it, um, the fact that, you know, that I was able to limit my practice did help people I think start to call me more, and so I, I was able to get a full-time collaborative practice much more quickly than I would have imagined, and, and I didn't make any less money, quote-unquote, that year than I had in prior years. I had to have a whole lot more cases, because you don't charge nearly as much per case, but cases started to show up, and, and, uh, and I've been practicing ex exclusively collaborative, or at least exclusively non-court. I'll occasionally take cases where, you know, the other side's not represented or something where I'll do non-court practice, but um, most of the work is straight collaborative cases.